Okay. Is this work? Ooh. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is a little intimidating to talk to a nice big room. Um, thank you so much for all of you for being here. Um, I'm supposed to talk into this microphone because there's online, um, but honestly, like this is there's it's a small enough group that I think it's really easy. If you just want to stop at any point, ask some questions, I'll give you the mic, <laughs> um, and uh, um, we can kind of go with the flow. Um, they are gonna um, they need to change over the room or something with the sound equipment. And so I'm, I'm gonna be pretty tight to the 30 minutes. So, um, um, but I'll be around after so we can talk to you. So um, I've been asked to, okay, so I am Matt Lake and I'll actually introduce myself. I am the acting air director for EPA region nine, been with EPA for 21 years, been doing air quality for about 30. So um, so I guess that's probably my excuse I, if I say things that, you know, undefined acronyms or anything else. So. Um, but I have been asked to give the um, AIR 101, you know, kind of intro to AIR. There are a lot of other sessions um, over the next couple of days um, that I'm going to highlight. Um, and, uh, you know, we can also, I'll take a little time to go into a little deeper um, dive into some of our grant programs and, and talk about that as well. So, um, but again, it's really around, it's especially because we have a nice group, it's really around anything that you guys are interested in. Um, I will say that there are people in the room that I know are e are more expert than me in certain things. <laughs> um, for example, Stan who, and Ben, who have been doing air monitoring for three decades, probably. So, <laughs> um, so you know, I'm, I will always phone a friend or ask for help if we need it. So, um, I also want to introduce um, Eddie, who's over there doing uh, tech support for me, I guess. But um, and uh, and Kate here, they are two of our um, tribal air coordinators um, in in my division. So, um, and I think most of you probably know them, but if you don't, uh, please introduce yourself. So, uh, Eddie, can we do the next slide? And, um, okay, so um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of the intro ones a little bit more, but but really what I want to talk about is what does EPA do from an air program side to support um, tribal air quality work? Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll dig into a few more details in each of these topics. So let's do the next slide, Eddie. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, about six distinct areas. Um, one of the things we call planning, so that's really our regulatory work under the Clean Air Act. I'll describe what that is. Um, and then um, we do issue permits. We also do permit oversight. Um, I mentioned monitoring. Obviously, that's a big thing is, you know, understanding your own air quality um, is really important to us. Uh, we give out grants. We're doing a lot of expanded work in wildfires, so that has its own slide as well. And of course, uh, we do have non-regulatory work on the indoor air quality side. Um, so I'll, I'll go into that. Uh, next slide, Eddie. So um, I know this is a little hard to read, so mostly I'm just gonna talk anyway. So so when we call uh, air quality planning, um, really the structure, so we really what we do is we work under the Clean Air Act. So um, so the structure of the Clean Air Act is, is um, one thing we do is we go out and try to understand the air quality, and that's on the monitoring side. And once we know if an area is um, you know, how does it compare to the national ambient air quality standards? Those are the, you know, health-based national standards. We will designate areas as either not attaining those standards or attaining those standards. And there's some things in between too. But um, uh, so once we decide an area doesn't attain standards, then that kicks off what we call the planning process. So um, I, you know, part of my goal here is to, um, for those less familiar, is to help you know where you might want to roll in the process, because obviously you have a, a, a unique role. Um, but uh, um, one thing that right off the bat is um, is designations. You know, is an is an area attaining or not attaining? Are you par part of a boundary? Are you your own boundary um, for your tribal area? Or are you part of a larger bar boundary with the state or locals around you? Um, and what are the implications of that? So that's a that's a good, um, very important role for our work with tribes. Um, also, once an area is not attaining, then the area does owe us what's called an attainment plan, um, and that's obviously what it sounds like. It's a plan to get into attainment, and um, really depends on the standards. Um, we can designate um, there's what they call six criteria pollutants. So it's particulate matter, ozone, SO2, lead. Um, uh, NO2 and CO, I guess those are all six. But um, for each of those, there's non-attainment areas. And, and for example, if you're non-attainment for ozone, like um, like the Phoenix non-attainment area in, in Salt River, um, you, um, 
<clears throat> then that area has to develop a plan to come into attainment. And that, that plan can take several years. There'll be an attainment date. That's the area. That's the time by which you have to show that you can attain. And if, if you can't, then there's implications to that as well. Um, but that's really what the attainment planning is. Um, that's what we call it. There's also underneath that are third prohibitory rules, like for example, Gila River, Ryan's in the audience, you know, they have their own rules for dust control. Um, so, you know, there's that, that, that we also call that planning. But all of those things um, from an EPA perspective, um, there's a requirement to do it in the state and locals and in, for some tribes as well. And those become submitted to EPA. Um, and, uh, and then EPA has to act on those and say, okay, yeah, that complies with the Cleaner Act. So um, we do have other things under the planning umbrella. One thing we care about greatly is, is um, visibility um, at, in what we call class one areas, which are usually like national parks, national forests. Um, and uh, that's called our regional haze program. I think some of you have heard of that. We also um, have special programs where one state impacts another state and um, we call that transport. Um, and that's pretty significant because um, sometimes, you know, tribes have their own treatment under that, and and some tribes also have treatment in a manner similar to state. So, um, so you know, one of the things we want to make sure is that the all the sources in one state are being controlled well enough so they're not causing problems in another state or, in a lot of cases, in another tribe. Um, okay, so next slide, Eddie. So I talked a little bit about it's probably good to combine things. Um, I will note on this slide for designations that one of the big things that's going to happen soon is um, EPA is uh, has proposed to lower the national ambient air quality standard for particulate matter. Um, so particulate particulate matter is classified by its size or aerodynamic diameter. So what we say is PM two point five. So that's like the fine particulate matter that can get deep into your lungs. So um, so we're gonna we propose to lower the PM two point five standard, the national standard, um, down to nine or 10 micrograms per meter cubed. So that's a lot of numbers. Um, I think some of you have a deep understanding of that. But if you're not familiar, it's it's the current annual standard is 12. So we propose to lower it to nine or 10. So that's probably a good reference. Um, uh, that we have not finalized that that yet. <clears throat> We're supposed to finalize it any day. Is It is with our um, White House Office of Management budget. So we expect to finalize that by the end of the calendar year. And that will kick off a two-year process for designations. So that's going to be really important. Um, we will be inviting um, all tribes that are impacted, obviously, to consult. So that that will be really important for um, for my program. Okay, next slide, Eddie. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about permits. Um, one of the things that EPA does um, is we are responsible for issuing pre-construction permits in in tribal areas. So um, we have an entire program for this. Um, in the um, in the last year, we have issued two general permit approvals. So a general permit is, a, um, I think we have nine types of general permits. So like, for example, a gas station. So, you know, something small typically, and we put out a permit and said, you know, for all gas stations, here's kind of a general permit. And, and um, this would be approvable if you kind of fall under these parameters. And then it's really a simplified application to EPA. So... Um, so we have uh, general permits that we issue. Um, there's an acronym NSR up there. That's new source review. So that is, again, pre-construction permit. So it's the permit that a source needs to get before they're allowed to construct. Um, so we have, um, oh, four minor NSR. So this is pre-construction registrations. Um, we also issued four minor pre uh, uh, permits for minor sources. So a minor source, um, again, is... It's, it's really a, um, it's a threshold, like how much emissions there are. So if it's below a certain threshold, it's considered minor. So that's a kind of an easier permit to issue. If it's over a certain threshold, it's considered major. And that threshold will depend on the attainment status of the area. So, um, and then um, we also um, have a special federal implement, implementation plan. That's what FIP is, um, that, um, that for oil and gas, um, those are all 10 of those where we uh, did those registrations are in Navajo Nation. So um, that was a big, big activity for us. And currently we have eight permit applications pending. So um, one thing I would emphasize here is um, if you're not familiar with this and you know sources in your area that have not sought out a permit, um, it's really important um, for them, you know, either for you or for the source, especially to talk to EPA, because um, we don't want to make sure sources are not constructing without the proper permits. Okay, next slide, Eddie. Uh, 
yeah, I think I said most of this. Um, again, I think actually the thing I would emphasize here is, is you know, obviously most of you are familiar, we have a policy on consultation. This is one of those instances where if we're permitting a uh, source in your area, it's obviously very important for us to consult with you. Um, we also have, uh, you know, in the last few years, we've changed our procedures such that we do share the draft permits in their entirety with, uh, um, with you, the, um, the representatives for the tribe. Um, also part of our consultation and with the sources. Um, so that's that's something that we did in response to some concerns that were raised, and I think it's working really well, but it's one of those things that if you ever hear about problems, or you have concerns, make sure you talk to me or, or our staff, so thank you. Um, okay, um, oh, uh, on there I do have um, two contacts, and this is on the, this I think these presentations are on the website, right? So yeah, so they'll have the contacts, um, the, and those are our permitting contacts. Um, okay, next slide, Eddie. Um, I mentioned air monitoring. So um, first of all, there are a lot of resources for air monitoring. And again, these slides are meant to be something that you could reference back to if you're not as familiar. Um, uh, we want to first of all offer that we have a lot of staff that are always um, very happy to talk with you and um, uh, um, you know provide whatever feedback or input that we can. Um, the TAM Center is an outstanding resource. Um, as is ITEP, so um, those are both in our region. The Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals is ITEP. TAMS is Tribal Air Monitoring Support Center. Um, again, excellent resources we can put you in touch with. Um, and of course, there's a lot of trainings um, online at theairknowledge.gov. Um, I think next slide's a little bit more on monitoring, Eddie. Um, so one thing, one point I wanna make is there's a lot of different reasons to do monitoring. There are, in Region 9, there are only four tribes that do regulatory air monitoring, Gila River, Salt River, Pachanga, and Morongo. Um, uh, all the other tribes that we support for monitoring, I think there's about 20 some, um, it's what we consider informational monitoring. Um, so that's a pretty important distinction from a regulatory perspective, um, but it might not make a big difference for the tribes actually doing the monitoring, so for some it does. Um, I think one of the things to do if you're considering monitoring for your area, because I think people generally want to know what the air quality in their area is, is, is to think about, um, you know, what are your goals? What do you need to know? Because um, frankly, it's a lot of work to do regulatory monitoring because you have to comply with all the EPA regulations. And, um, and, you know, it's usually pretty impossible for if you have a small staff size, for example, because there's just so much you need to do from a quality assurance perspective, for example. So. Um, uh, so there are reasons why you might want regulatory monitoring. For example, you know, Gila River for PM10, they have their own area and they don't necessarily want to be part of the Phoenix area. So that's a good reason to have regulatory monitoring. Um, but, uh, but there are a lot of times where it, you know, if you don't have that use, um, but you just want to know what's going on for your air, um, and be part of the conversation or make sure that, you know, um, that your people are being protected, um, then you, you know, there are other types of kind of what I would say is lower effort ways to still answer those, those same questions um, in a very valid way from a science perspective, just not complying with all the regulations and that would be informational. So these are conversations we'd love to have because um, you know, I think it's important for all of us to have an opportunity to understand our air quality. So I you know, encourage um, if you wanna follow up on this um, with me or Eddie or Kate or any of our monitoring staff, we are very happy to. Okay, Eddie, next slide. Actually, I'm doing pretty well on time, but I want to leave enough time for actual conversation. So, um, so one of the things that's become a very big deal over the last few years is wildfire. Obviously, I probably don't have to tell anyone that because uh, you actually live here. But um, uh, you know, we've um, from a from a EPA perspective, we don't regulate most of the activities that are involved in wildfire, but it's a it's an enormous public health concern. And so, one of the things that we've done is we're really putting we're helping put out better tools and information to the public so that they can actually reduce uh, their exposure to wildfire smoke, wildfire related smoke. So um, one thing I wanna highlight is this is the AirNow website and AirNow, a lot of you know it because that's where monitoring data is made available to the public. Um, but there's actually, um, there's a really good resources for wildfires. So you can either go to fire.airnow.gov or you can go to airnow.gov slash wildfires. And um, we have resources, um, that uh, we call be smoke ready. So, you know, basically have a plan, um, you know, have, you know, if you can, air filtration or safe spaces um, uh, in the event of a wildfire. 
Um, and then when smoke is in the air, how to actually make decision making. And then after a fire is, is, is you know, how do you know it's kind of safe to return to your homes or things like that. So um, thank you. Um, so these resources are available. And, you know, again, we're always kind of revamping this and rethinking this, um, but it's really important from a public health perspective and want to make sure that um, people are aware. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it's the next slide, Eddie, or if it's still this slide, but one of the things that we've been doing is we've been, um, uh, I don't know if it is or not, but um, uh, we've been working um, to put on trainings. Um, ITEP has helped host trainings for tribes, uh, uh, um, uh, tribal environmental professionals to, um, you know, use these resources and understand, um, you know, how to work with your communities uh, during smoke events, which again is really important. Um, okay, so for this slide, um, I want to emphasize, uh, uh, you know, we do a lot of work with indoor air quality as well. Um, you know, not, not, a, not, I should say, I shouldn't say that. We do as much as we can, given our resources. I think all of us have that same challenge, um, uh, since this is not a regulatory program. Um, but one of the things, uh, it is really hard to read that, I apologize. Um, but um, we, we do have a small grant program. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is look for ways to um, amplify our, our small amount of grants. So, you know, um, for example, uh, the asthma management work, um, you know, working in communities to, you know, find sustainable models for, you know, in-home asthma work. So um, that's been an effort for a long time. Um, and then we also put out a lot of information resources. Um, for example, there's a brochure on the right there. Um, uh, it says improving your indoor, I don't even know what it says, environment, I apologize. Um, I don't have it memorized, but improving your indoor environment brochure. So there are a lot of resources. Um, we kind of put it out in a way that it should be easy for you to reference, but most importantly, easier for you to kind of you know, hand out to your community or, you know, work with kind of knowledgeable professionals like physicians and others in your community to help get those messages out to the general public. Okay, next slide, Eddie. Okay, so grants. So this is pretty much the last thing I'm going to cover. Um, and I'm going to zip through it. But this is, um, I want to dig a little deeper because there's so much money out there right now. And um, some things I can talk about and sometimes some things I can't because there are actually open solicitations. So, um, so in my program, um, you have a lot of different programs represented here. Um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, that's uh, out of the administrator's office. But in my program, we're doing the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants. Um, and I want to talk a little bit uh, deeper dive on that. We have Laura in the room, who has a talk of her own. And she's going to be talking about, I imagine, the Environmental and Climate Justice Block Grants. See, there we go. Um, and then I will, in our program, um, I, I have those final three as well, the ports, methane emissions and clean heavy duty vehicles. What I will say in general is um, for most of these programs, there is a tribal set aside. I think that's really important, obviously, because, um, you know, they're, I took to heart the comment from yesterday at the RTOC that these are difficult programs. I looked, I, I just looked up and um, the notice of funding opportunity for the CPRG, it's a 63 page NOFO. So I was like, okay, yeah, that is very intimidating. <laughs> There's a lot there. So. Um, but anyways, uh, we can't help you apply, but I think what we're trying to do is maybe reduce the barrier to applying and make sure you have the resources. Um, there are resources out there. So um, let me just move forward a little bit and focus on the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Eddie, I think you should have to go. Yeah, so um, let's do that one. Thank you. Um, so um, this notice of funding opportunity for the implementation grants is out. So I'm not going to say anything that's not on the website. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I do want to make a couple points um, that are very clearly on the website I looked yesterday. So um, it's a $300 million tribal set aside. So um, it's actually, a, uh, wait, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping ahead. It's actually a two-part program. So the very first part was the, was the planning grant. So, um, you know, we're super proud of this. There was um, $25 million to tribes nationally, and including, included in that is $5.9 million in Region 9. Um, we, in Region 9, we funded 21 grants to tribes covering 54 different tribes. So, um, again, I'm, I'm really proud. I think we're, we're seeing that. We're starting to go out and talk to people. Um, uh, it really does cover a lot of Region 9, but potentially not everyone. So one of the things that we've been doing also is working with our um, state recipients of the, of the planning grants. 
um, and um, they are they all have a component where they are working with tribes as well. So if if any of you in the room are not a recipient of the planning grants, but you want to be part of the process, um, Kate's going to have a talk on Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit. Um, I think specifically um, the California representative will be here. So. Um, so, you know, talk a little bit about how you can be involved if you don't already have a planning grant. Okay, so why does that matter? So there is, um, on the implement implementation side, there's $4.6 billion for implementation nationally with a $300 million tri uh, tribal set aside. So one of the key things is you, um, that, that star at the bottom, you must be involved in a planning grant to apply for implementation. So what I would say is the activities that you're applying for under implementation grant have to be covered by uh, what's called a PCAP, which is, uh, it's a, what is it? It's the priority climate action plan. Thank you, it's the priority word that was getting me. So uh, we just say it so often that I forget what the acronym is, but, but um, the planning grants uh, from the first phase, their priority climate action plans are due March 1st for state and locals. I think they're due April 1st for tribes. Um, and those activities under those, PCAPs, um, that's what's eligible for the implementation. So if you're going to apply for implementation, um, and they're bit, you know, it's a three hundred million dollar tribal set aside. The the grants are going to be between one and twenty five million dollars each. So it's it's big amounts of money. So I definitely encourage all of you to work together to you know, because um, it's not simple to apply for these, um, but it has to be covered under the planning side. So okay, I think that's. I'm going to keep moving because we're going to run out of time for questions. So next one, I think. Just going to finish with grants. Yeah. So the final thing is, um, uh, the um, I'm really proud to say that last year for grants, um, I think most of you are aware there was a 20% increase in Clean Air Act 103 and 105 grant funding, um, or is that just 105? Both. Wonderful. Um, and the good news is that um, at the time, I think we thought of it as a one-off. It was an increase in funding because we had additional funds. Now we're very much thinking that it's going to be um, that future levels are going to be at that at that increased funding level. So um, it, we know it's not enough. We'll just say that off the bat. But it, I think it helps to have a 20% increase. So we're very excited about that. Um, for the for this upcoming year, um, the announcement for um, funding availability is going to be in November, and uh, proposals will be due in February. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So I'm going to stop. Um, can we? I think we'll skip ahead to the contact slide, Eddie. Yeah, I'm going to have to skip this. Um, can I, for the DIRA though, there is a talk tomorrow, so it's not too horrible to skip it. Um, those are the contacts. This is online. Um, again, please don't hesitate to just contact me or Eddie or Kate. Probably all three of us are likely to get a response quickly. Um, you know, we're, or we'll be around. So thank you. Appreciate it. Um, okay. So questions. And thanks for the sound. It didn't reverberate at all. You did a good job. <laughs> I don't know if this is a good time to bring this up like after your session, but um, I think um, some of the tribes like in, in Region 9 are um, running into issues on trying to get like their um, their standards uh, certified um, because a lot of the, the standards labs are are pretty far and few and and a lot of them like uh, you know, they don't have the capacity to take on a lot of tribal air programs uh, in our area. Um, I mean, if there was like a possibility for like some funding to set up something like down in this region uh, for for some of the tribes to, to use, that would be probably great. Number four. Is it working? Okay. Is there a particular? Uh, thank you. Um, is there a particular geographic area that you're that tribes are struggling more? Or is it okay? Yeah. Right now, um, there's two standards labs that are close to us in Region Nine. Yeah. One in Richmond, which is EPA's standards lab, right. and then one in Sacramento, which is the CARB standards lab. Okay. Um, we've been using the the CARB standards lab uh, because they've welcomed us uh, for the past few years. But we've run into some issues where uh, they had like had like a shortness in staff or something, and, Got it. and they we couldn't really piggyback on them anymore. So um, I know a lot of like 
especially the regulatory tribes are, are trying to figure out, you know, where they're going to take their equipment uh, if, if something like that happens. Okay, yeah, we'll, um, we'll follow up because I think this is, yeah, that's really important. So thank you for raising it. Yeah, and I, and I definitely understand. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. We can see if we can find funding or whatever the barriers are. So, okay. Stan, are you going to comment on that? Yes, sir. <laughs> we use uh, the CARB uh, laboratory standard. Um, you find out you have to uh, uh, advance your timing on that. Uh, we, we found out, and it's like uh, you have to uh, reach out to them three months ahead to, to plan to make sure you uh, keep your uh, standard uh, certified within the uh, uh, yearly uh, standard. And so it's, uh, we've been informed, so we've been uh, kind of reaching out three months ahead of time to ensure. Yeah, they're, they, they don't charge us for that, which is good for a tribe to uh, use a CARP standard. Thanks, Dan. You're, uh, Yeah, I. Yeah, that's a problem. Daryl, are you with Pachanga? Uh, I'm with uh, Paula. Oh, Paula. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, we'll follow up. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem, but I understand. Yeah. Are, are there any questions online? Just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, just for the for um, Dan Davis of the Center for Indian Community. There we go. Yeah. Um, permitting. I'm, I'm in monitoring mostly, but permitting. Was there a, a place where I can go to figure out, because we're doing emissions inventories, and I'm mm -hmm. like, well, what permits do we have? And I didn't know if there was a place where that we could figure out what EPA permits are on the, the community. Plan. Oh, absolutely. I don't have that off the tip of my yeah, yeah uh, okay, tongue good. or whatever. But yeah, yeah. We're, I, didn't, um, I just didn't know. That's reach out to me, or actually, Sheila, is Sheila on there, or is it? Um, I'll get you. We can get you the Catherine's on there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, it was just more of my information. We can get that. Know. Yeah, I, I just don't. Know. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's the, we we have that. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Are you going to say something? You look like you're going to say something. <laughs> I just need information on the monitoring assessment. I know you five year assessment. Cover that. And yeah. For I know, uh, I think Region Nine submit their uh, information to the headquarters. Is there any information when uh, announcements are being made on that? You mean in terms of a timing for guidance on the five-year assessment, or are you just saying oh, for the, the oh the, the needs the assessment? Monitoring oh. needs assessment. <laughs> I haven't heard. Did you hear any timing on that? Yeah, this came up. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the timing is, but we'll double check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We I haven't heard anything in the last couple of weeks. So maybe if sure. anyone else has another you guys question. Have tough comment. questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll follow up though. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Len Drago. I'm with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality and Tribal Liaison. Uh, we have a border team for ADEQ, and one of the questions that have come up of recent is the IJA, the Infrastructure Investment. Jobs Act dollars oh, yeah. for ports, and there's been questions about defining ports. Mm -hmm. Have you all figured that out? Whether it could be for the border um, port of entry, mm -hmm. port of entry, right? Yeah, it's definitely gonna. Okay, so there for the um, this is under the okay, so this is under IRA ports, the three billion dollars. Um, there's a lot of discussion of, of the definition of ports. Um, the NOFO is not out yet. I think it's going out in February, so I don't know for sure. Um, but there's at this point, I'm fairly positive they're going to include inland ports, you know, um, so which is good. Um, and I think ports of entry are part of that. So yeah, it's it's really about any also not just port of entry, but you know, goods movement and transfer. So we're going to have like um, like Colton around here. You know, there'll be things that are going to be eligible. Sorry, you're from Arizona. That was a bad. It's close to, <laughs> it's like intermodal facilities and things like that. So it'll be inland ports. So I'm fairly positive, yes. Um, but uh, I don't know that we've said anything publicly. So that's probably as much as I'm going to say or should say. <laughs> All right, we'll keep an eye on it. Thank you so much. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, it's a very good point. We're, we've been a huge advocate for that.
Yeah, Ryan, you here. Uh, Ryan Everly with Healy River Indian Community. Um, I, I want to thank uh, EPA, uh, your staff uh, in Region 9 for just your ongoing assistance with a lot of different projects, whether uh, for us it's mainly monitoring, but also just other QAP development. Um, we're doing some monitor impact assessments. I know you guys have kind of been a little bit involved in that and, and permitting assistance. Um, I do want to encourage, uh, I guess, a little bit of the outside the box thinking when it comes to QAP development. And one of the, the challenges I think that is um, maybe not unique to tribes, but certainly uh, affects tribes more is just resources that are available for um, getting the things done that we need to get done uh, in in claps and uh, especially on the, the regulatory monitoring perspective I, I know there's a gold standard as far as you know for regulatory development but it, it's very difficult sometimes for tribes to get to that gold standard and we can have an equivalent standard but I know it's it can be it seems like it could be challenging to allow some alternative method because you don't want the floodgates to open for all this other you know potential uh, solutions I guess that each require a case-by-case -case, you know analysis it's a lot of it's it's resource intensive and I understand that um, so yeah just further encouragement to, to work with us to find those uh, solutions whether it's trying to come up with a way to um, certify like a zero air instrument or or calibrate that when vendors don't offer offer that um, or you know just changing out uh, met met station equipment and and I think one of the challenges that we have revolves around the, the calibration and the in-use date versus the calibration date. And that's a huge thing. And I know that, you know, we've had several back and forths with some of the, um, you know, quality assurance folks. And, you know, it's, it's not a must. It's not a must. And it's a should. And there's a lot of, you know, reference to old documents. And, and, I, and I know that's the easy answer. But I think there are, are better ways, and, and we're willing to, to kind of search those out and, and propose those. Um, but there, I think there just needs to be a little bit more of a, you know, hey, let's, let's try to come to a, you know, a, a better solution. It may not be the one that EPA wants off the bat, but I, I think we can find something that will work for, for both, both parties. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for that comment. And for the for those in the room, I think that's there are probably unique aspects of that comment for the the four tribes in our region that are doing regulatory monitoring. But I think there's also the broader comment of just the how onerous quaps are for the people who are not doing regulatory monitoring as well. So thank you for sharing that. Thanks for making this talk a lot better by kind of helping gather. <laughs> this is a huge room, so this is it was nice. I appreciate the. Uh, friendly at it like it was felt like a nice atmosphere in a big room so <laughs> oh man <laughs> yeah yeah well thank you I really appreciate it thanks for the tech support too okay thank you thank you